Hi, everyone. This is Sean Blackwell from BipolarAwakenings.com. And today I have with me Tim Canote. He's a client of mine from the Netherlands. And uh, Tim and I started working together in 2016 with his first retreat. And he's had a lot of healing done. He's off his medications now. And I thought you guys might be interested in hearing his story. It's pretty interesting. And he's been doing quite a bit of work in the Netherlands as well on sort of the alternatives to psychiatry movement. So I thought it'd be great to have him here. Tim, uh, thanks for joining me. Hi, Sean. Nice to see you again. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Tim, why don't you just jump into it and tell us about your first episode? Because it's pretty interesting because it happened in Africa, right? In December 2013, I went to Ghana for my study. I was studying healthcare technology. And by the time I was struggling with my identity and I didn't really know what to do or what I wanted. And I saw Africa as a new change where I was going to find myself. Basically, the, a, a similar story as every student these days. Every student goes, go, is going to Africa or to, go, to yeah. Asia. Everyone in Europe, yeah. right? Europe has got this yeah. thing for Africa. Like They're all going to go down there and save Africa. And go to Asia and mm -hmm. come back with uh, yoga pants. And uh, they're okay. all very zen. But I didn't know by the time that it's going to be that huge of a change. And so I've had this anti-malarial drugs uh, prescribed by uh, Dutch uh, GGD. Okay, malaria um, pills, huh? Malarium, mefloquine. Okay. And this with a huge load of uh, side effects, which I didn't know about by the time. And I stopped uh, smoking. If I was smoking marijuana sometimes and I quit this. So I was very open. And by the time I went there in Africa with the culture shock. And also for me, it was the first time that I was on my own, that I made this decision from the heart. I felt that I really wanted this. Before mm -hmm. I just couldn't make any decisions. I was completely blocked from my intuition. So it all started to change when I first followed and trusted my heart in combination with the culture shock and eventually not sleeping for a week. And you might know if you don't sleep for a day or two, what happens? Yeah. So I was there um, um, wandering around in my, uh, my guest house uh, family. I was in this more, um, Islamic family and I really saw the comparison between my Christian background and I found out that there is not much of a difference and I saw the beauty in, in and all the lovely people there which uh, from, from the Netherlands we were warned that it's poverty and that people are uh, that they are poor but I mm -hmm. found and I saw that they were so rich of love and uh, harmony and I thought well these people found something more valuable than ma materialism okay so I was really um, getting conf confronted with myself in the early in the week and then <clears throat> I uh, went to this hospital where I did my internship and after some days without sleep I was just kind of getting into uh, this energy of, oh, yeah, let's do this. And this shifted from, I was a person that was very numb. I didn't bother about other people. And then suddenly my, my, my student friends, they saw a change. Like, well, well, why are you so excited? Why are you so, uh, what are you telling? And, and they were all completely cut off because it was 40 degrees and they're like, oh, chill out, man. And I was, Yes, let's do this. And I came to this insight. I was writing in my diary uh, every night because I couldn't sleep and I was processing all these impact from the day. And I was, was writing that, that I was going to improve the communication between multiple departments. And for the first time, I really found uh, an intern motivation to do something with my study. And once I was writing this down, uh, I, I got this sudden voice coming from outside or inside. It was a clear male voice telling me, uh, Tim, you're here on earth. 
um, to help other people on your uh, in your way and you're doing it good already and i was like what the fuck is this and and it, together with this voice there was this this light coming through me or clearing all my blocks and my uh, pains and my throat was completely open like energetic blockages huh? like you felt like there was this energetic blockages that were opening up yeah my okay. entire body was completely full of chills and uh ecstasy kind of feeling okay and according similar to that i was oh my god my my uh, i um the walls i was living in were completely gone and i was like okay this must be a sign of god and uh, i'm jesus the second i'm gonna write my own religion and it felt as google was in in my system and i had answers to every question on on earth and i was like oh my god i'm gonna be famous i'm gonna change the world i'm gonna bring world peace and without limitations and uh, and i remember looking I thought, myself i thought mirror. that was my job i thought i was the one bringing world peace no <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're all, all asthmatic yeah, folks bringing world peace <laughs> yeah later on i found out that was not jesus the second but maybe jesus the 2015s or maybe <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so i looked at myself in the mirror and without a week uh of sleep i uh i had this how do you call this uh voila big circles under your eyes circles, they were almost to my up like to these? my shoulders really yeah i had, I had this uh, filthy beard just like jesus did maybe jesus beard was more trimmed mm -hmm. than mine but um <laughs> and i saw this light and i was thinking this is not tim uh, it felt like my ego, my identity, I once had died at that moment. And I felt that I couldn't go back. So what happened eventually, I started to, I was so completely in the present moment that I couldn't make any choices about whether I should go to uh, my, my internship or whether I should I respond to my family or my girlfriend by the time. Uh, so I just let go of all my stuff. And I started to wander around with my underwear and uh, a blanket around my head, uh, telling to people there that uh, I'm going to bring world peace and that they just have to look in my eyes and it's going to be all right. And then at that point, uh, I was just completely in this, what I found later on, this kind of spiritual awakening or emergency. But then I was just, this is... Uh, a religious thing that was the only framework i could hang to it yeah so if you're wandering around the streets of ghana and you've got a cape on and you're telling people that you're there to save them that's pretty far gone right yeah but it's pretty, pretty far, far gone, gone but yeah. also very uh, close to the real me i felt more alive than i ever been before and i wasn't mm, really yeah uh, screaming and yelling on the street. I was very gentle and subtle, uh, 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 making contact with people. Not uh, so. Mm. I went to an elderly person on the street and I said, "Sir," and then I made this very. It was very subtle. And with my sisters from my uh, guest family, they uh, they introduced me. So they were walking with me. Like, this is this is Tim, and he's. Uh, he stays with us and they were actually enjoying my presence. And once this, this sounds that I was far gone, but the Ganyan people in a way were, they didn't judge me and they were like, maybe put on a, a t-shirt the next time, but they were kind of interested in what I <laughs> wanted to say. You needed to fly back to uh, Europe sort of by emergency or something, no? Yeah. Well, I got uh, into a, tiny clinic eventually because I had this conversation mm -hmm. with my dad and he said you're, you're it's not going well and I'm like yes it's going well I've known all the answers to the universe and I understand everything and then he said but you you're feeling too good which is not good and then he started to cry and his emotion shifted something in me and then I understand understood that I really had to find help so the basically took me to a, a clinic 
uh, put some medication inside me. And the last thing I remember is I was standing on the airfield between paramedics. They were all escorting me and putting me in this stray. Uh, how do you say it? Uh, oh, like restraints? Yeah. So that, And I felt, just let me look outside of the window of, the, of this tiny airplane. And I want to enjoy the view. But this mm. situation with all the paramedics, it uh, induced my, uh, my thoughts about being special because everything was arranged around me. Yeah, it certainly was. <laughs> and eventually I stayed there for three weeks in, uh, in, in, in this private Ghana, Canada clinic. It was... An Canada, like Canadian clinic? Canadian, yeah. <laughs> I never... Oh, okay. I did, didn't know that. I, well, I know. Yeah. I, uh, it's funny that you, I'm just seeing the link now because mm. you're a Canadian guy. So they flew you from the, a smaller place in Ghana to a bigger city where they have this Canadian clinic? Yeah, they Is brought me the from Tamale, Tamale to Accra okay. and to this private Ghana, Canada clinic. Yeah. All right. Which All right. is, I'm very happy that I didn't went to mainstream psychiatry there. Right, right. So was this a place for international people? Yeah, they, they rich take, African people. Rich African people. Okay, so you kind of got a blessed situation there in a sense, right? Yeah, because the uh, my uh, insurance from the Netherlands and this company called SOS International was trying to arrange everything to get me back. Mm -hmm. They just my family couldn't go to come to Africa to just take me and escort me because of all of this vaccination. But I didn't mm -hmm. want to go back because I had this mission of world peace. So it was a struggle for them to, to, uh, to, to get my permission of wanting to go back. Mm. That's why it took so long. When, when did you finally go back? After one month in, in Ghana. So okay. one week I was free and then three weeks I was uh, hospitalized. But the hospitalization there was, I could walk around, I go to uh, talk to the people, uh, to the guests there, I walked away from the clinic sometimes in the night. So I wasn't in a closed apartment. Okay. All but right. once I got back to the Netherlands, everything changed. Yeah. yeah. And were you hospitalized in the Netherlands too? Yeah, I went straight um, to uh, people like paramedics came uh, to escort me. Mm -hmm. So from the ambulance to the uh, to the business lounge in uh, at the airport, they uh, brought me uh, straight from uh, the airport in the Netherlands to the um, to the psych ward. All right, and then when? How long were you in the hospital in the Netherlands? I think for two or three months. Oh, two or three straight months, huh? So quite a long time. But, the, yeah, from the closed and then eventually to, to an open apartment. But I was 20 years old by the time, so I fell under the youth. So I okay. came open the apartment with all depressed kids, right, which right, right. didn't help yeah. at all. I was completely, uh, when it was going well with me, mm -hmm. I was uh, felt, um, taking all the medication and that helped me stabilize, but nothing of myself was left. I was just completely zombified in a way. Okay. And then they said, you're doing well, you can go home. But at that time, I didn't know what well or home was. I was just, okay. I mm -hmm. think that's the paradox of when, when it's going well, when, yeah. Yeah, when it's is. going well for everybody else. It's not going so well for you. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 But you, you got out. And one thing that was interesting to me was you were talking about the spiritual dimension of your episode quite publicly early on because you you put an article in the guardian right yeah in 2015 almost two years later but not with my last name i changed my name because i didn't want this psychosis team be connected I felt like i couldn't find work or something but sure afterwards and now i'm all over the place yeah I can't go back. That's kind of right. But uh, a little bit like me, though, you saw the value from your experience. Even after your hospitalization, you could see value in your experience. Definitely, and that's what kept me 
going and that saved me because I felt that there was such a need to share the story that people in, in the first place shouldn't take this malaria pill, larium. And other than that, I felt that in this psychosis or in this spiritual crisis, I found out a blueprint of my future and what I was capable of. And that I later on, I'm not there to bring world peace, but find peace in myself. And then step by step, I can uh, bring it to uh, my surroundings. Yeah. And I, and I've told that uh, to a few other clients too. It's like you, just because you have these grandiose ideas doesn't mean that it's a complete um, illusion or a total fantasy. It's just, you need to take that power and then just bring it into sort of day-to-day life, you know, instead of this sort of, I'm going to be a global success story. I'm going to change the whole world. You just start to live it day to day, you know, um, and integrate it, make it yeah. small, and be nuance it. Yeah. But what was cool about you is that mm. even though you had such a long hospitalization, you were still quite like proud of your experience or, or you felt validated by your experience and you didn't let the psychiatric system invalidate that for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because and, uh, maybe the stubbornness or this is, it felt so real that, you can diagnose me and you can tell me what symptoms are in this category, but I wanted to know what it meant and how I could live and learn from it. And so um, eventually you found me. What attracted you to my work? Well, it started with, there was this girl from the, the organization to, which helped us go to Africa. And she heard my story and she had some kind of similar experience, uh, a spiritual uh, experience. And then she was doubting if that was called a psychosis. So she was researching the relationship between psychosis and spirituality and found you. And then she sent me a video about the real cause of bipolar disorder. And I started to watch this and I'm like, Finally, the experiences I was having were put in some kind of framework where I could see the value and it was validated that there was meaning in it and that, that there were more Jesus figures around. Right. And what's funny for me when you say that is you had the same experience with me that I had when I found Stan Grofsburg a year after my experience. I was like, oh, he's talking about spiritual emergency. This is what happened to me. This is the structure. This is, you know, everything that happened to me is in his book and he's interpreting it completely differently, you know? So with that whole framework, it's very validating. And so then when you see my work, basically you're seeing Stan Groff's work and it's like the same experience, you know, just a little more accessible, right? Yeah, Uh, that was so amazing. Yeah, and then we met at the Crazy Wise Conference in the Netherlands, right? The second year. You, you were in the middle of a second episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> in 2015, yeah. I fell in love. And this love I couldn't uh, handle. It was too intense. And I broke out of some old patterns. So it was actually necessary, this episode. Yeah. And, and we... so like, I gave a presentation and then you were there with Laura. And you were like, I'm only here for 30 minutes, but I just wanted to come and say hi, right? <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> I'm in the hospital. I'm like, oh, okay. And, yeah, and then you said maybe you can do a retreat someday. Yeah, and, I and said, then do you? Yeah, what did I say? And then you said, well, maybe you'll do my retreat someday. <laughs> <laughs> you'll do a retreat at me. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe I'll take your retreat. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll see each other again. <laughs> maybe we'll yeah. see each other again. Yeah. So then you did, you started doing retreats. You did a retreat with me, was it 2016? And then one in 2017. And you did uh, a little bit of work with my second client, who's now a therapist in Germany, Moni Kettler. You know, retreats, retreat with Moni. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Hi, Moni, if you're listening. And um, (laughs) do you just want to tell people a little bit about what those experiences were like for you? At that time, I had a second hospitalization. I was on lithium, so the mood stabilizer. And I remember talking to my girlfriend about that I wanted to do this retreat. But you're in Brazil. And I'm like, oh, this is too much 
it's impossible. And then the next day you post something on Facebook. Hey guys, I'm going to uh, Europe. If you want the retreat, I'll be there in Spain and Germany. So hook me up. I'm like, this is uh, no coincidence. So I sent you a message and you said, well, if you have the opportunity and some money to do this, it's best to just do it as early as possible because you get the best out of it the sooner you do it. And I've, it resonated so much that I um, convinced, well convinced, I was talking with my parents and and they said, yeah, let's meet this guy. And then you met them online and uh, fit correctly in your criteria. And you found that, you said like, it's, it's a, a mild disorder. Maybe I thought, you need yeah. a yeah, I thought you had a mild disorder. Retreat. Yeah. And then we went to, uh, for a 10 day retreat to Germany with four, with Moni, you, my, with Lara, my ex-girlfriend. And, well, just to fill people in on the 10 day retreats I was doing at that time, we were basically doing one session of bipolar breath work a day, sometimes maybe two. And um, bipolar breath work is an offshoot of holotropic breath work. I've got videos on my website about that if you want to take a look further into that. But basically, we were taking Tim into a non ordinary state uh, where he is able to get in touch with the same energies that were ca causing his manias, you know? Except you were yeah, pretty quiet, right? I was quiet and uh, I was kind of numb, disconnected. I was mellow guy and mm. everything was fine and very, I was open, but there wasn't, wasn't that much of expression. Right. 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 But and your energies, girlfriend. but your energies were being picked up and this was something new for, for myself. I knew it was happening with other clients, but um, I was picking up Tim's energies and so was Moni. And I remember you had one session where it ended and I just felt like my head was a watermelon and I think Moni was crying. I mean, that's what the energies were like for her. Yeah. They were just knocking her out. And so we started to experiment with having Moni breathe with you, you know, in sort yeah. of surrogate style. And then and that's, that's a new approach, right? Yeah, and that was a whole new approach for us. And it to give you an idea, I think it came, we had done breath work with you for four days and you weren't moving very much, but me and yeah, Moni... Well, hmm? Maybe at some point I, 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 I was breathing, 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 and focusing how should I do it am I doing it right and then kind of quickly I went in this sleeping state this yeah sleep. like a shamanic I sleep. couldn't remember and I woke up and you were guys like what happened I'm like <laughs> whoa well, this was a nice uh it was a nice sleep and uh and then you shared stories that I was my shoulders were like this and my eyes oh, popped yeah. open and I was yeah. looking to mommy and that she had this kind of uh, yeah, vision of my uh, my soul uh, in a way. Do you remember? Yeah, I want to see if I can imitate it. I want to see if I can imitate what your eyes were doing. They were kind of going like, uh, and then all of a sudden it would be just be like, <laughs> and we were we were kind of freaked out. We were like, whoa, what's going on? You know. So even though you weren't detail, expressing yeah. yourself that much, you were clearly in a deep process. Yeah. Yeah. And then she, Moni, saw something that in the beginning I opened my eyes and then I went back and later on I opened them again. But then I looked straight to her like, oh, <laughs> and it felt for her that she was trying that, that she is going to help me through this process. Mm, okay. That's what we found out later that this connection that when I went to this deep state was even uh, there when she was going to the grocery store. Yeah, but she was picking up these energies from even without being in the room. Right, and maybe to it's fill in. Detail. No, no, yeah. but just to give people to fill people in a little bit. Once we saw that Moni and I were um, picking up these energies, then uh, we started to experiment. Maybe she could be the facilitator, and I could breathe for Tim, or maybe I could work with her not in the room, and and things like this, and what came back and what Tim's getting at is that in every session that Tim had, Moni was feeling the effects, whether she was in the, in the um, 
house with us, which was a German house in the countryside, or even when she went to the grocery store, we sent her out once and said, well, you go do your things. Let's see what happened. And she just said the whole time that she was out, she was just completely drained and that that feeling didn't resolve until she got back in the house with us. Right. It's kind of like this. So it was really clearly like this healing field guiding us. It was like, Tim, you're the client. Moni, you're the surrogate. Sean, you're the facilitator. Don't screw this up. This is how this works. And <laughs> Lara was, was doing good. her part too. Love yeah. surrogate. Yeah, was Lara was picking love. up energy. I but love, to, yeah. Yeah, to give people an idea of how heavy it was for us though, uh, after four days of working with Tim, we all needed a break and we all went to a swimming pool. We went to the pools to take an entire day off after just four days um, because that was how intense the energies were for all of us, except for Tim. He was doing fine. Um, and then when we came back from the pool, then we started to do, work through this again, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's some funny uh, detail that you had this dream. You were always dreaming every night because we were staying with mm. four of us in this house that, that really involved intensity of the entire retreat. It mm. changed now because, right? And um, I remember you were talking about that you had a dream about uh, a frisbee. And that you saw a frisbee, and this was kind of a metaphor for who I was. You just throw the frisbee, and you go with the wind, just like I, I uh, stepped on my skateboard and throw, went down the hill and then crashed, and then just went up and said, hey, I crashed, nothing happened really. And then yeah. you it's didn't know. your effortlessness, know. right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And then you, you, you came with this image of a frisbee, and then I was, dude, I have a frisbee with me but you never you never saw it yeah it, yeah these kind of things happen these yeah unexplainable synchronicities yeah and i've done okay. i think i've done 49 49 retreats at this point and a frisbee has never come up in another retreat uh, not <laughs> to my knowledge it was uh yeah and that then i started teasing i started calling you frisbee boy yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you were just you just had such an effortless essence to you and the way you rode your skateboard coming on and off and then seeing the frisbee and that just seemed like your true essence right and that's what i picked up in that dream some days later i was i remember i was standing in the kitchen i was just standing there and i felt that i was something shifted in me and i saw you guys there was more light um like i saw your light and i remember you were saying to me from the living room, me standing in the kitchen. Look at him. You're just standing there, really there. <laughs> present, present. And present. Like something, you felt something change and I felt it too, very subtle. Mm -hmm. And then my last session, I was laying, um, we were holding hands, I think, maybe Moni and you on the side. Yeah, yeah. There was this energy going from us and then and then you remember also, uh, you feel at that point when it's enough to let go, when the energy mm -hmm. stopped. Mm -hmm. And it, you were representing my, my father and she, my mother. And I was very thankful that I had this opportunity of being here because this therapeutic session it is such an equal uh, way of uh, working together that you became, uh, we became instant family in a way. Because you're going 10 days, um, sharing everything, breakfast together, evenings together. So this is such a big difference than the therapies I experienced before, which is good. But I felt this thankfulness and I was laying on my stomach on the, uh, on the mat and I felt my heart beat inside my entire body and I was, in touch with my tears and gratefulness and like I was embracing the earth and I could feel how gently the earth was uh, was moving that I was uh, open and that all opportunities op opportunities were going to unfold and that I just uh, like some gear shifted in me that uh, mm -hmm. my soul eventually found this rest in my body and the Moni said, after this session, you're now completely healed, which was maybe 
not in a way something healed but later on not completely but that felt so pure and so nice that the trust that someone says you're healed or you're actually you're healing mm -hmm. that was um yeah beautiful yeah it, it was a very strong feeling of deep healing that i had too and we we really felt a sense of completion uh but tim had another episode how, how much long later yeah one and a half years okay and so then we had another uh retreat yeah. for you in 2018 which we can't get into we don't have time to get into but um uh that continued your process and then yeah. you've been working with moni lately independently do you just want to tell people a little bit about what you've done independently with Moni? I went to Bonn multiple times, like uh, two sessions a day mm -hmm. for a period of four days. Yeah, so four, they're not in a I've retreat. Been... They're in Bonn, just a couple of sessions a day for a couple of days, right? Yeah. Um, four hours from where you live in the in Rotterdam area. Um, and how have the breathwork experience has been for you there? Because you started out in the retreats you know, in 2016, you were quite, like you said, numb. And how are you now? Now I'm uh, more connected with myself. It's easier to access uh, this intuitive feeling. So when I'm on the mat now, I get this thought or voice saying, lay on your stomach, lay on your back, do this, yell. Or uh, that there's some kind of guidance which allows me to express what has to be expressed. Mm -hmm. And that I can access this material easy, easier than uh, back in 2016. In 2016, I just went there and I couldn't do anything. But now I can uh, find my way in it and know what comes up and feel uh, every energy in my body when, I, when I'm stuck here or when I'm feeling uncomfortable or... I can feel these emotions without losing myself. This psych psychosis vulnerability is now integrated in myself and I'm still in this higher state of consciousness, mm -hmm. but with my both feet on the ground. You're grounded. You're just connected to that spiritual dimension in a better way, right? It's like a broader, it's like better broadband, you know, better, better internet connection. Right. right. Yeah, and just to fill people in, what's going on is, you know, when you've got your disorder, you've got these bioenergetic blockages. And so during breath work, you've done some over breathing, and then you start to have physical sensations that can be very strong and sometimes painful. And you've got to be able to like physically express those things um, and vocalize them and sort of just get them out of your system through self-expression. And that's what Tim wasn't particularly good at when we first started because he was so numb, he, he sort of had, had to have his system all sort of reconnected again. But from what he's saying now, he's much more able to get in touch with those emotions and express it and, and get it all out in a very physical way, which is what we're after, you know. And pretty much, yeah. pretty much all the clients that have done two retreats have been more expressive in the second retreat than the first. That's for sure. Yeah, it's, it's like I'm... Uh... My heart, my, my, my body, my soul, my, my, my thoughts and my brain are more connected now, in line. So when I speak or think, there's no, no much of a, a block. So you've done a lot of media in the Netherlands, which of course is all in Dutch, but you've been in newspapers and web newspapers, you've been in the radio and you've been on TV in a few situations. How has that been for you and what's it like? Yeah. <laughs> What's it like? Yeah. Fame. All this fame. You've been having a little oh, bit of fame. It's true. Yeah, it, it's kind of crazy to see that my craziness from back in, the, in, in Ghana is starting to be wisdom from now. That it's starting to get real. And that this vision about, yeah, I'm going to get famous, I'm going to change the world, that it's not that much of a disease. You know, yeah. I've had I've had a fair amount of clients now, and you're the one uh, who's been the most public about your story and, and been in the media so much. Do you think your sense of mission from that first manic episode dr drives you to do what you're doing now, like being public with everything? I think, yeah, I think yeah. that's the 
there's the, the core or the, the beginning. You think on the whole you were treated pretty fairly by the media? It feels like the Netherlands and the media are, are they're loving the story. Some friends, they say, you really Dra milking this out or how do you say it <laughs> you're milking it out yeah 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 that's yeah like you had this one experience and now you're making trying to make a living out of it come on one, one friend he said i was on <laughs> I was on the tv checking uh, random programs and i saw your face again all right different channel because i know the story already <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, but you know i you know my experience happened in 96 and I still have certain situations. Just last week, I was doing some online event and this guy tells me, Sean, could you come on? Oh, no, it was a course here in Brazil. And um, the coordinator wanted me to come to the course and tell my story, you know? And I'm like, dude, it's been 25 years. I'm getting tired of telling the same story over and over again. But it's important, you know? And, and the same feeling that you have too, which is, is look, I'm just gonna tell my story and some people are going to resonate with it. And some people are going to think I'm still crazy. And I can't control that. And you just put it yeah. out there, right? Don't worry it's about, about this one, one light. One point of light is enough for someone to change his life. Candle in the darkness. Yeah. Candle in the darkness. And if I can be this candle, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. And that's what I needed. And that's what I'm bringing. Now. You've been more than candles. You've been, you've been like a fireworks. You've really... In the Netherlands, you've been absolute fireworks. You've been a nuclear bomb, so thanks. And so also now you're working in the mental health field and that was your area of study already. Just to close out, do you wanna tell people about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm working two days in uh, UMC Utrecht. It's a academic uh, hospital with this guy, Jim Van Os on top of it and uh, <laughs> on top of it. This guy, Jim this Van chair. Os. <laughs> uh, what's his position? He's he's got a pretty. Jim Van Os is a professor. I, mm -hmm. I don't know his position. He's a professor. He's 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 setting the new lines in in the Dutch uh, new movement about more person centered, uh, not only focusing on the bio uh, biomedical system, and that there's more to it than just a uh, disease. And I'm working in inside psychiatry for four different clinics it's uh an over uh yeah like a helicopter function so i work with almost everyone Sir? it's not my job to advise them to get off meds but right. sometimes when people hear my story and when they talk with me clients patients they think they can get off meds so um, it's difficult to get my vision in line with the vision of the hospital there's so much more room for people with lived experiences, but it's not really embedded yet in the entire organization structure that they want in every structure, every line in the organization structure, uh, a peer support worker. So well, they want to implement peer can, support at every level, huh? Every layer. Yeah. And then oh, okay. so they can give advices to the core, to the, I don't know the terms yet, but um, that is not just an addition. And, oh yes, we have a peer support, and we have to do this because we uh, uh, because it sounds fancy. Because right. that's a bit how it's like. I think you guys are the front line, you know, and where things are going to take place. To be quite honest, because I I think that there's just more open mindedness uh, about trying new ideas uh, in the Netherlands and the culture of the Netherlands um, than I've seen anywhere else. So I'm very optimistic about what's going on there. You know, it's not perfect. And I'm sure it's going to take some time, but to get things in at an institutional level, I, th I see it happening in the Netherlands before anywhere else, to be quite honest. Um, Would you work with people in acute uh, psychosis? I have. I've worked with people in acute psychosis, but logistically, it's just hard to make it work, you know, because when someone's in an acute psychosis, the first thing is that their, their parents or the police, they don't know anything about our work. So they take them straight to the psychiatric hospital and there they're medicated and they're traumatized by the hospitalization process and the whole bit. So I don't get the opportunity to work with somebody fresh. Like they just come straight mm -hmm. to me. Right. Um, so that's why that's we what I'm working. That's You're what I'm working people? now. Well, not working with people, but I see them coming in fresh. Oh, okay. 
in his hospital yeah. and then i'm talking about look when you're out of the system there's this not there's this opportunity you can have this yeah. graphic so i'm really promoting uh this uh, this way of healing inside the system but inside this mainstream yeah like, uh, you, but you i have know, to be careful though yeah you got to be careful but you know what would be great is is just to have one little transition in psychiatry which would be for them to get curious about our experiences, help people see the symbolic meaning of those experiences like yours did, and then say, listen, you need your medications for now to stay grounded, but there are ways to work with this in the future. You know, mm -hmm. right now we need to medicate you, but it's not the end of the world. It, it, we don't have to have a like sort of psychiatry versus anti-psychiatry conflict. You know, it can be integrated. So that's, I can think that I can work this vision out. I yeah, you're gonna. Uh, can you have that done by the end of the week? Can you get that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can. Get it. <laughs> I've been working 13 years, man. You know. But anyways, in, I, we should wrap it up though. If you, if you want to add anything else, um, maybe a nice detail. Next uh, month, the coming weeks, I'm off meds for two years, straight. Right. Yeah. It's this been two cycle, years. and this cycle of getting into mania uh, has stopped thumbs up for this and yeah <laughs> congratulations you know in closing do you have any advice for people yeah any famous last words from jesus mm -hmm. christ number three million <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> yeah well don't don't rush to get off meds just know that it's possible and that it for me it helped me so a lot that i know that this guy is working with people like me and if i could do a retreat tomorrow or one year from now or two years that it's possible, that's enough. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks and uh, for for all the effort uh, about the past 13 years, because I think we spoke about this in the last retreat or maybe a year ago that it's really unfolding around you now that there are people getting involved and that you can lay, sit back a bit and then <laughs> let it, let it, I don't have to worry about where, where my next meal is coming from anymore. And I don't have to worry about the work dying because you're out there living it. Moni's yeah, out there yeah. living it. And other people are standing up for the work as well, like Kirsten Ogard in, in Finland. So I feel like it's, it's in good hands if I ever get hit by a train, you know, <laughs> I think things are going to happen. And I would just say for anybody listening that hears Tim's story and goes, well, great, but we're in the COVID. And even if we weren't, I can't afford to do this kind of work anyways. It's way too expensive with the flights and the hotels and everything. But, um, you know, we won't get into it today, but I'm doing distance work now that takes advantage of that surrogate breathwork connection that we have. Uh, the healing field is in the quantum dimension. There's no time and no space. I've made recent videos about the surrogate breathwork that I'm doing at a distance. And that's been really interesting work. It's going quite well, especially if you think you have empath characteristics. Well, thanks, Tim, for joining me today. It's, uh, I really appreciate you standing up for the work, especially in the Netherlands, which I think is an awesome country. My first love is Brazil. Number two, it's the Netherlands, baby. Okay? Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> number three is Canada, okay? Canadians don't get upset. <laughs> but it's number one, Brazil. Number two, the Netherlands. Number three, Canada. Okay. I'll All see right. you in Brazil right. one day. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Come on down. Great. Yeah, man. Thanks.